Hello, welcome back. This is a video which is a bit of a different time. I'm answering questions that people have sent me. I'm walking, by the way, on the West Cliff at Ramsgate where I live. It's normally lots of people walking dogs, which is what Ramsgate's all about, apparently. Everybody likes a dog. Here we are, cleaning up after your dog. Dog. Dogs, dogs everywhere. So, I'm going to do this in two parts. The first video is going to be about music and my life is on the edges of the music industry. And the second part is going to be about all the other things like my Ramsgate walks and Cliftonville and Margate walks and my seaside walks and that sort of thing. So, let's have a look and see what the first question is. So, the first one comes from D51 who asks, what was your favourite pub rock venue back in the 1970s and 1980s? Well, um, obviously my favourite pub rock venue in those days was the Cricketers, which of course I was at from 1980 something to 1990. 30th of September 1990 was our final day there. But to go to shows, I suppose my favourite would have been somewhere... Well, it basically all depends on what I was going to do and who was who who was playing because um because obviously bands like say dr feelgood used to play at well lots of places well i saw them most often at the kensington that was great to see dr feelgood but also see other people there and it wasn't quite as good i don't know why but dr feelgood there was always really really good they didn't really have a very good beer selection as i recall so it was a bit hit and miss there but um, Hope and Anchor I always thought was a bit small, a bit sweaty, which was great if you want that kind of thing. But again, it wasn't the best place if you want to go out and have a relaxing night out. So um, where else was there? I used to go and see. In the early days, I used to go to the Windsor Castle, Harrow Road. That was good, though again, they didn't really have very good bands as I recall. I used to go to a pub called the Bush Hotel at Shepherd's Bush. That was, again, that was very low-key bands. Not your Dr. Feelgoods or your Elvis Costellos there. But it would be, okay, I mean, it depends on the band. Depends on the thing. So I don't really know what my favourite pub rock venue was. I suppose in the later years, the Weavers was always good because Joe Giltrap used to put on a lot of great bands, which were to my taste. And I suppose the Roby, a lot of bands, I saw a lot of great bands at the Roby. And the Half Moon Putney, of course, because I was involved with that to a certain extent. So, all in all, it would depend on who was playing and what was on. Places like the National and the Red Cow, fine. I used to enjoy watching bands there. But, um, again, I wouldn't say that I went to a certain place just because it was there. I used to go and watch a band and if they played it somewhere I liked, then I used to enjoy going to watch them. So, there you go. And there are lots of places I have not mentioned. But, um, you see, there's a lot of places which never get mentioned at all, like the John Bull in Chiswick, which is a good place. I used to do shows there. Um, East London, the Bridge House, Canning Town, I used to enjoy that. That, that, that was always a bit more dangerous because it was always there always be some sort of well it's always a bit of a thing to get there and back really because there's always be some sort of adventure on the way to um, um, Canning Town. This was pre the London Overground and that sort of thing. So you're going on the East London line or various versions of it. I can't remember. He's actually a bus I think. think. But um, there you go. All good fun. And um, let's look at the next question shall we and the next question comes from someone somewhere asks of all the acts who played at the rhythm festival who did you consider the best to work with and the worst right just to say at this stage I've see, written down all these questions but I've not prepared my answer which I suppose is a good thing or a bad thing depending on how you look at it um, so, which is the best, um, well, at the Rhythm Festival, obviously, which was the thing, the festival I ran in Bedfordshire between 2006 and 2010 or 11. The, the best bands we had there were, there were quite a few actually, obviously, 
Gandalf, Murphy and the Slambovian Circus of Dreams as they were then. They were really good. And then we had um, Prince Buster was really good, I remember that. To be wise. He was quite interesting because he asked for, I've never been asked for this previously, he asked for um, fish but he wanted the eyes, that the head is left on so the eyes were visible and I found out later that's to do with actually freshness, um, a bit scared of being poisoned by our, our fish. Um, Prince Buster was great, and um, we had a big star. <laughs> Alex um, Chilton, that was um, a bit more obscure, but they were one of my musical heroes, and he was a good man to speak to. He died not long afterwards, bit of a shame, but, I, but we had a little chat before he went on stage, which again I can't remember much about it but um, it was very interesting. I seem to remember thinking at the time what a very nice interesting chap. And um, who else do we have on there? The Whalers, um, Troops from Hotels. I'm just going through all the um, all the reggae and ska bands now. All the big, there are so many big names, so many great people who played there because that was the point of it that Roy Harper, um, Jerry Lee Lewis, um, Arlo Guthrie, Richie Havens was absolutely marvellous and a really nice chap. And Arlo was well, there are lots of excellent, excellent, excellent acts on. And um, who's the worst? Well, there was a very strange thing which may, you see, to don't forget a lot of these things, it might be me who is um, at fault because. I was very tired when I was doing the Rhythm Festival and you had a lot of people who were basically giving you a lot of stick and asking you things and put a lot of pressure on and it was just people asking you for things all the time. More, more, more. More beer. More food. I want this. I want that. Da, da, da. So you get, after a while you get to be very um, defensive. So quite often these things when you look back on them it might be not exactly the person's entire fault but I can remember an incident when we had a 10cc and this was when we were still at um, Twinwood and I happened to be by the um, entry point where this tent by the entrance where the bands and people came in and were registered and they got given their passes and then shown where to go, which stage and then they'd be welcomed so apparently Graham Goodman of 10 at CC turned up and he um, came up in this Range Rover thing, smoked glass windows as I recall and they were open and they were sitting in the back and the guy came in to get his ticket so I went out there and I saw him sit in the back seat I went up there and I stood outside and I said oh just to say Mr Goodman thank you so much for coming, it was really great honour to have you play at the Rhythm Festival and as I was saying this he wound the window up so that was fun and then later I was summoned to the dressing room of 10 at CC. I must go now, it's very important. And the tour manager gave me a piece of paper when I get there, it's, quite, it's so urgent. Now, now bear in mind, I'm the person organising the whole, the whole festival. We had people backstage who were taking care of these artists. We had people doing great work. They were stage managers, we had stage crew. So he yes, summoned me and told me basically to photocopy his band's um, set list. So I can't remember what happened then. So, so they weren't exactly my favourite act that, that played there. I'm sure they're, oh yeah, Joe Bonamassa gets an honourable mention here. Of 
because there was something about his payment of coming He did get paid in full, I, I, I might add. Everybody did. Everybody got paid in full, apart from me, of, of course. But remember that he stood there for about 10 minutes berating me about what an idiot I was, etc. How he could buy me and sell me, etc. So that wasn't very nice, but <laughs> just one of those things running a music festival. Apart from that, I didn't really like his music. I think he probably guessed that anyway. Right then, so number three. Ah, this is about my famous stutter, or not so famous in this case. Claire Horrocks asks, considering you have a stutter, what made you start making YouTube videos? Well, that's an interesting, interesting question, isn't it? And a lot of people ask me that. Not all of them nicely. Some people ask me in a very um, not nice way. Uh, but basically, it was... I wanted to do something else, and I decided that I wanted to get rid of my stutter. Now, back in the 1990s, when I was looking at Time Out, I made a few videos for Channel 4, because they had this thing called Right to Reply. And because I had a stutter, um, I wrote an article about it in Time Out, which is a, it's a humorous article, and it was picked up and syndicated in various places. And so this producer who worked for Right to Reply at Channel 4 asked me to do a video for them, for their programme, which was like a points of view, except it's like a half hour programme every week on Saturday evening on Channel 4, basically about what was on that week's um, TV, with special emphasis on Channel 4. But now, Channel 4's programme 2020 Vision comes under the critical microscope in the programme where you answer back. It's the right to reply. So I did this and we made this film and they, we went out with a film crew and we shot it in um, outside Granada TV HQ in um, Soho Square, I think it was, and um, then we went off somewhere else and filmed somewhere else. And it's basically, I think, about how in Jimmy McGovern's latest drama, may have been at Cracker, the bad guy, the murderer, is always a stutterer. So, and so I did this um, fake anger thing, because I didn't really care, but they wanted me to do it, and I got a bit of um, exposure for it, and I got paid a bit. I think I got paid for writing it, because you didn't get paid for appearing, but I got paid for writing something. So it was good, don't get me wrong. I mean, I enjoyed it, and, it was, and they asked me back a few more times, and I really enjoyed it and then I think she moved on and that all all dried up so just to put that into into context so there's a bit of a background here so I thought why don't I make YouTube YouTube videos I was watching people on YouTube like bald and bankrupt who I thought was doing a very good thing he was in India at the time now then the reply you're gonna get to how are you is almost always gonna be Baria what Baria Barriers means like great, good, because Indian people will never, when you ask them Orbais up, kese here, or just Orbais up, they're never going to reply, oh man, what karab, aj what karab. Indian people are very positive, so they will always answer Baria. I was also going to India and it seemed like a very good idea, so I'd also wait just to conquer my stammer. You have referred a couple of times in things I have read to your, your what you call your attractive impediment. Can you tell me what that is? I said, I can't say the words... Dama. I have! <laughs> That's part of the idea. It's not the whole idea, but it's part of it. And so here we are. This is, what, two or three years later? And I think my stutter has changed. It's um, slightly less prominent. If I really think about it, I can speak without, st without stuttering. But then, if I really, really think about it, I start stuttering. So, 
best not to think about it really. So, that's, I hope that answers that question. Probably not, but who knows? Let's see what the next one is. Of course, doing my phone one-handed is not easy, especially as I've got, as my arms speed awake with the camera in my right hand. So, of course, needless to say, I'm having problems now. Oh, for God's sake. Right, here we go. And the next question is... Random Tina asks, did you ever meet or work with any of the Beatles? Well, that's an easy one to answer. Answers, well, I did meet practically all of them, actually, apart from John Lennon. I met Paul McCartney. Well, I didn't meet Paul McCartney. I was in the same room as him twice. The last time was at the 100 Club, where he was doing a secret show to save the 100 Club. And I wasn't supposed to go, because uh, at the time I was in um, Jeff Horton's Bad Books. Jeff was the guy that still owns the 100 Club. And he and everybody knew that Paul McCartney was going to do this sh secret show on a, a Friday lunchtime. And Jeff had invited everybody, all the people who, uh, who he knew, because Jeff likes to hang around with famous people. So he invited people like Paul Weller and people like that. And even though I was the person doing the Friday nights at the 100 Club, and, my, and I had a show later on that day, I wasn't invited. But I went anyway. <laughs> I went anyway. And my friends in the security let me in, and I was fine. And Jeff nearly... Well, he was very surprised to, to actually see me, let's just say that. He didn't actually say anything, but he was... Very surprised. So, um, Paul McCartney did go right past me on that occasion, and I was standing very, very, very close to him, and I could see in his eyes he was, I don't know, he just looked um, scared. Perhaps that's me projecting onto him. And then the previous time I saw him, same kind of thing. I was in this room. This is back in the eighties and it was in um, EMI, in it, um, what square was it? I can't remember now, it was Manchester Square, wasn't it? And I was there to see someone else, and I accidentally went in the wrong room. It was like a boardroom -y type thing, or meeting room, and sitting there with these two people, who I subsequently realised were Paul McCartney and Linda McCartney, and I said, oh, pardon me, and I just left. And um, then they obviously sent some security people out to see who I was. And then they found out that I wasn't going to murder them. So everything turned out okay. Um, I met George Harrison in... Well, I didn't meet George Harrison. Again, I was at a party. And I think Neil Innes was there, which might be why I was there. And George Harrison was in the opposite side of the room. And that was about it. We didn't speak. So I did stand by and watch him talk to people and I was overhearing what he was saying and none of it seemed particularly interesting and I seem to know that he um, smoked a lot which um, obviously not the best thing to do so don't get um, children if you're a famous musician don't smoke too much it will probably lead to an early death and then what's that and then Ringo Starr Oddly enough, I was in a lift somewhere, and where was that? It was at some hotel in, I think it could have been the Hilton Hotel in Park Lane. It was in one of those Claridge's Savoy, something like that. And I was just in the lift, and I think I'd gone to the wrong floor or something like that. So, to cut a long story short, I ended up down the basement in this lift, and I decided to go back to the ground floor so I press the button for the ground floor and then it comes to the comes to the ground floor and before I can get out of the lift this entourage of people which are mainly security men big guys bouncer type guys came bundling in and I couldn't really get out so I thought well I might as well stay because I've been in the lift for about five minutes going up and down so I might as well stay in 
and um, hello. hello, and um, so then when I was wondering what was going on with these people, I saw that the person in the middle, the smallest person apart from, well, smallest person in the lift, after about eight of us, was actually Ringo Starr wearing dark glasses. This would be, I think it's the time I was looking for time out. I think I'd been interviewing the bare naked lady, so it would, so that's why I was there. I was interviewing somebody. And, uh, and I think I was a bit drunk, because I think I went to the bar afterwards and a few drinks. So that might have been why I was just let myself be uh, kidnapped by Ringo Starr. And then he went up to, actually, I think it was, was Hilton, because he went up to the top floor, which is like a Contiki bar or something like that, I, I, I seem to recall. Not the same bar I'd been in. I'd been in some sort of piano bar. And um, Ringo Starr and his entourage got out. And I was tempted to go after them, but I decided to go down to the ground floor again, which I did and caught my number 12 bus home. So there you go, that was, that was my wonderful time socialising with the Beatles. It's not exactly to Donovan's story, but there you go. So, and that's all really, so, so I'm not exactly a friend of the Beatles, though I have been a very, um, I'm probably one of Linda McCartney's biggest customers for her, her sausages. Right, this is from Cleethorpes. I don't know. What type of music do you enjoy listening to most? Well, I have a very wide range. Um, music. I, I suppose going out to shows, I've really cut down on it since the uh, coronavirus thing, so I've not been to any gig. I've not been to a gig for ages. The last gig I went to was a comedy gig, and that was with Russell Brand. Before that, it was Frankie Boyle, a warm-up show he did at the Soho Theatre, and before that, Richard Richard Herring, I think. But um, and, and then before that, Stuart Lee. That's probably all the gigs I've been to in the last three or four years. I've been to more than that. I've been to shows, yes, but I can't think what. But for, for music-wise, I tend to listen to stuff on iTunes nowadays. I don't have any of my old vinyl anymore because, frankly, I don't need it. And I have it. Lots of things on iTunes. I've got many hours worth of music on iTunes, ranging from African music to obscure 1940s and the 50s R&B and blues and so. And I tend to listen to it on playlists. Actually, talk about that, I was listening to my, my iPhone, which I've got this, uh, it's random play, it's called Jim's Radio Station, which is basically what they do. They just play your stuff that you normally play, I think. And I was listening to that the other day, and, I was, and it, so it's playing stuff that I might or might not like. And then suddenly it played Supertramp, which to my knowledge, I've never knowingly put on any super tramp at all in, in my life so frankly I think the algorithm got that slightly wrong but I like a lot of the stuff I do listen to when I'm walking around with my headphones on or earphones whatever you call them would be a lot of Skull, Toots and Mateos, a lot of reggae, Desmond Decker, a lot of stuff like that just stuff just stuff really, and I, I like Cake, the band Cake from the 1990s. I like s some of their stuff, not all of it. So it does vary the whole time actually. It does vary. And I like hearing stuff that I don't know. If you know what I mean, that I like. There's a lot of stuff I'm, there's a lot of stuff from the 1990s and, and, and actually later than that, that I'm getting into now. Because it was, at the time I was not really into it. I was doing my own sh shows. So it meant that I wasn't really listening to much new music. So there's a lot of stuff there, which I'm starting to, um, because frankly, up until the time I did Rhythm Festival, I'd never heard of Arctic Fire. And that's so, uh, yeah, just start the ring. So there's stuff I want to know more of, but I find that stuff that's modern and recent I just can't seem to get into. I think that's maybe me, maybe them, but it's not ideal, put it that way. 
So, I think we've got time for one more, although I have been rambling on a bit, haven't I? The last question comes from Paul Hill. Will you be doing any more gigs? Um, I think that means will I be putting on at more shows? And I certainly intend to put on at least one more Margate rhythm and rock, if that's what they call them, because it's been so long, what with the um, Covid thing, that I... Because originally we were supposed to be doing the last one in, was it supposed to be in 2019 or 2020? But now we're looking at 2022. And it may not be at the Winter Gardens at Margate because they may not be open when we want to, to do it. So I'm talking to various more people. So hopefully we'll be doing that in 2022. And frankly, that could be my last ever live music show. But let's, let, let's see. In fact, oddly enough, somebody asked me to do a show for them recently. And I was almost tempted, but I did say no. So let's see what the let's see what life brings, shall we? So th that's it then. So if you like this, please like it. Please let me know what you think by commenting down below, and also please subscribe. C click the notification bell and. You will hear about them before I do, almost. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you next time. Goodbye. That's all, folks.